Greetings from Ghana, West Africa. It is my pleasure, first of all, to thank the members of University of Alberta Symposium Planning Committee, particularly Duncan Sanders, Sky McLuggan, Q Young, Jeff Taylor, and all of you who have helped to make this day a possibility. Today is a historic day being made at the University of Alberta, and I'm very pleased to see the university taking such a leadership role in this war. I must thank you for taking the time to put this symposium together because though Canada has never had anyone die or had a case with Ebola, Canada has played a very important role in the war against Ebola. Today we're going to be discussing the social consequences of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, how it has devastated the entire community, both people are either infected or affected. What made Ebola so different from HIV and say malaria or Lassa fever, other kinds of viruses, is that it broke down the whole contact system of families. Imagine being a mother, having a baby with the Ebola virus and you can't even hug your child or hold your child. I want to focus on five key areas, which I believe are the heart of every community. I want to first start with the children. When we were doing our work with HIV AIDS, I would go into the villages, I would meet the children, pick them up and hold them and cuddle them and kiss them. You can't do that with Ebola because the whole thing about Ebola for it not to spread was not to have direct contact. It takes two to 21 days of incubation period for this virus. And so many of the family members are afraid of bringing these children into the homes. I will plead with the international communities. There are many social workers who have a lot of expertise on how to care for these children psychologically. They have lost parents, they have lost their homes, they have lost everything that they ever knew. And on top of that, they are suffering from the stigma of the communities that they were from. Many of the schools were closed down because people could not go to school because of direct contact. In fact, in Liberia, schools were just reopened after seven months of closure. Leading right into the second social consequence is families. Family is the basic unit that nations are made out of. And when the family is devastated, the nations are devastated. everybody hurts to comfort in your Everybody hurts. It broke down the family structure, broke down some of our cultural practices. The breadwinners have been taken out of families. As the breadwinner goes, poverty is deepened. One of the ones that is very near and dear to my heart is the healthcare workers. Our few doctors and medical professionals. In the year 2000, I had addressed medical doctors at the US Medical Association to come to Africa to come and help us to fight HIV AIDS. At the time, we had one doctor to 103,000 people. In many of these communities in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, there were very few doctors as it is. And so the international community had come in, like Médecins Sans Frontières, and other medical doctors and missionaries had been in place to help. These good Samaritans of ours, as they came in direct contact with Ebola, patients have passed away. I want to particularly thank Dr. Adadevo, who was able to identify Nigeria's index Ebola patient, who came from Liberia, a diplomat, Patrick Sawyer. Many of the healthcare professionals, including Dr. Adadevo, who, by the way, was a Ghanaian working in Nigeria, lost their lives. But can you imagine, Nigeria has over 170 million people in a densely populated nation. If that index patient had not been contained and we had had an outbreak in Nigeria, it would have been a different story altogether. And as we come from the healthcare workers, it dives right into the fourth, which is the health care system, or the lack thereof. In many of these countries, such as Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia, and particularly Liberia and Sierra Leone. They had just come out of a very devastating war. Infrastructure, healthcare systems, zero. There were no gloves in many places. In fact, the commissioner of police who 
helped us during the HIV AIDS pandemic, who used to work with our NGO, Necotec Center of Excellence, is now the head of police and they were responsible for taking the body bags of the people who were dying on the streets. And initially when they started, they didn't even have gloves, PPEs and all the things that are very common in the West, we didn't have. Therefore, the healthcare system was so compromised in those countries that the Ebola virus just broke out and there were no systems in place to investigate early to be able to control and prevent. For instance, in Sierra Leone, the Lhasa Hospital was the first place that the Ebola virus was diagnosed. At that time, many people thought it was Lhasa because the symptoms were very similar. And so the healthcare system could not detect early. The healthcare nurses had had direct contact with some of the patients already. And it led to the death of the doctor who spent 10 years of his life setting up a treatment center for Lhasa was killed by Ebola. The fifth social consequence, which is crucial, is food. Many of the farmers abandoned their farms and so food production dropped. Everybody hurts. And many people were hungry. Everybody hurts. The Lhasa fever, for instance, is caused by rats. Those rats go and they affect food. People eat the food, they get sick. And so as the same symptoms were happening for Ebola, people were not sure what it was. And so food became a problem, food security an issue. If you don't have the right food, your immunity becomes worse. And so people's immunity were breaking down even more. So what must we do? First thing we must do is not to get complacent. There's been a lot of good news in the airwaves these days that the numbers have come down, the number of cases have decreased. The fact that you don't see the numbers does not mean that it doesn't exist. Some of the places cannot even be reached for it to be recorded. I want to share with you 10 key points that we must look at to drive Ebola to zero. We must have a multi-sectorial committee in each country. There are lots of multiple lessons that we can draw and create best practices and lessons learned from Marbeck, Lassa fever, even malaria, this multi-sectorial committee can share these lessons that it has learned. This will help to strengthen our healthcare systems much more with this free flow of information share. Once we bring all the sectors together, the next thing we must do is to strengthen our healthcare system. The nations need money. We need to train more doctors, train more nurses, make sure that they have the right protocols to be able to first investigate, detect, control, and prevent any and the next virus that we should be able to contain it and quickly get rid of it. Thirdly, we must come up with a comprehensive economic and social recovery plan coupled with executive action to rebuild and restore these communities. The nations need money. Priority, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. With these three, we must have a radical, rapid response. The fourth point goes to the industry. I must applaud Canada for ZMAP and the other organizations and institutions, companies that are developing vaccines and medical therapies to deal with Ebola. We must not relent, we must not think it's over. We must continue to do research and for the industry to look at even generic forms and different kinds of treatments must be tried on Ebola. The fifth is for the universities. I would like to see more discussions in this area because this is now the virus of our century and therefore all medical students and medical schools nationally, internationally, must start to look into this area. We believe there are geniuses in our universities. Through research, we will be able to come up with new findings that can complement the efforts of industry. The sixth thing that we, as the people of Africa, must do is to set up community advisory boards. The community advisory boards must be in charge of continuing the education at the community and grassroots level. This piece is crucial. The community health educators 
must be in every single sector of the community to make sure that this information is being disseminated. That is what will drive out the fear. When people have information, they will be empowered and be able to stand to fight the virus. Now, the international community can help in this manner with flyers and banners and those kinds of pictorial dissemination materials can be brought in. Many of these communities do not have the money to do printing and advocacy work and so this is where the NGOs can support driving Ebola to zero. The seventh key to drive Ebola to zero is prayer. In our communities, the houses, the churches, all the religious homes must take a very active role in handling Ebola. We believe that there's a spiritual aspect that we cannot rule out in our communities. There should be a place where people can have some comfort. Churches and mosques can play a big role in taking care of the people who have become destitute and are falling outside of the family circles. Number eight is the crucial role of the international community in driving Ebola to zero. I want to thank the international community for what has been done so far. And we beg the international community to increase their financial support, their social support in terms of social workers being brought to the area, their expertise, the Eradicate Ebola Now project of which I am chair is setting up the first Ebola virtual teaching hospital. Many people are afraid of Ebola. They would want to contribute, but they don't want to have the physical risk. It can be done by technology on this Ebola teaching hospital virtual network. We invite the international community to take this war on with us to win and to drive Ebola to zero. The ninth point is for us to pay a special attention to the children, specifically the orphans. For instance, when we had our HIV AIDS program, we realized that in the rural communities, many families could not even take care of their own children, let alone take on an additional burden. And so what we have had to do was to support those families financially for them to accept these orphans, to enable them to grow up as normal children. Africa has something very unique, our extended family system. This is the time for us to empower the extended family to hold on to these children, to enable them to grow up as responsible citizens of our community. The 10th key, which I think is one of the most important keys, it is that key that had the men and women who left the comfort of their homes to come to us in West Africa to help. It is that key that caused you to set up this symposium, even though there was a lack of funding. It is that key that drives many of us day in and day out. It's a key which is the most lethal weapon for mass salvation called love. I believe that the whole warfare against Ebola will not be successful. In fact, we cannot drive Ebola to zero without love. It has taken a labor of love to reduce Ebola. It has taken a labor of love not to have let the outbreak reach 500,000. It was because of this labor of love that today we are able to come to a place where we are getting close to driving Ebola to zero. I encourage all of you, everyone has this weapon. Let's use it. This weapon will enable all of us to leave a legacy of life for the next generation. And one day when the story is told, it will be said that there was a generation of people who loved so hard that they drove out Ebola. I thank you for listening and God bless you.